Uh, okay, I think I might kick us off um, and then uh, and then yeah, I'll just introduce everyone and, and give you a kind of picture of what we're here to discuss um, and then I'll hand it over to, to the guys. Um, so I feel really lucky that they're here to, to speak to us today. They're one of our customers and we're, we're very lucky to have been kind of witness to their data journey. Um, and had a front seat and watched them grow as they have. Um, so they'll be talking about that impressive journey and, and kind of what helps them shape that. Um, so just to give everyone a bit of background on who I am, uh, my name is Emily Jones and I am a head of customer success at Clean. Um, and with us today is also our very own Matt Sawyer, who is our chief data officer and founder of Clean. Um, previously worked in businesses like Trainline.com and Mondo Group, um, and of course, Just Eat. Um, and then we've also got our lovely customers, uh, Dr. Christopher Luke, who is a data scientist at Blue Light Card, and Alex Gray, who is head of data analytics and insight at Blue Light Card. So um, I'll leave it over to you guys to, to kick us off. Perfect. Thanks, Em. I'll just make sure my mouse is working. Excellent. Here we go. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us this evening, taking time out to come to our webinar. Um, as Em said, I'm Alex. So I head up the Data Insights and Analytics team at Blue Light Cards, and I joined back in December 2020. And I'm Chris. I'm the data scientist. You can drop the doctor. Don't worry, Emily. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I was hired back in July 2020, so almost a year now, which doesn't feel like it. It's very odd. And I spent the first six months basically defining the infrastructure and data pipelines that BLC needed to be able to deliver more complex machine learning solutions. So a bit of an outline about what we're going to talk to tonight. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, we'll do a bit of an overview of BLC. Um, anybody that hasn't heard of us, we'll just get a basic overview. We'll go over the data situation pre-data team. So from when I first joined, up to when we established a proper team and how we went from a team of just me to an organized and useful data warehouse. And finally, we'll outline why we chose Clean, so how they've helped us on our journey and what's happened along the way. So Blue Light Card was founded in 2008. It is a two-sided marketing and discount service, which was designed for emergency service workers like NHS, fire, police, and founded by Tom and Steve. Steve was originally a police officer and Tom was the sales guy. So they teamed up in order to bring something back to the emergency services and people working on those front lines. Um, we work now with over 15,000 different partners to provide offers to our members, uh, which range from home, fashion, holidays, days out, everything in between. And since founding, we've been we've grown to over three million members who join on a two-year subscription service. Perfect. And obviously, um, we collect a lot of data uh, on members and such things. So, firstly, the data we collect on members. So, three key areas really. Um, all we collect. So, firstly, is demographics. So, we collect things like age, gender, um, their trust, um, what their occupation is, and so on. We also collect their subscription details, so when they are going to renew, when they've signed up, so we can just check if we are seeing those renewals come through and when people have signed up in terms of longevity with Blue Light Card. We also collect app web interactions, so our two key products are our website and our app, and we just see what members are engaging with, so what they're clicking, what they're viewing on our app um, and our website. And we also collect customer support tickets, so if any member's got an issue with logging in or an offer or whatever it is, we collect that data coming through um, and also member spots an opportunity or something for us to for blue light cards to do something differently or better we also collect that kind of data so we track the kind of member id through uh, and we can then work with the tech, tech teams or we can work with the customer support team to make sure we're bettering blue light cards in, in that way from members support second area is partner um, so firstly we collect offer details so we want to make sure we've got the right offer on for the right partner so we want to understand when the offer has started, when it expires, and what the offer is. So is it 20% off, is it 30% off, and so on. So we collect all that sort of data for our partners. The second thing is a company overview. So making sure if a company's got certain locations, if it's an in-store offer, we know where the, there's located. So we can push around offers um, out to local members. 
We also kind of pick up what category they're in. So if they're in fashion or in fitness or whatever it is that Chris mentioned earlier, we've got loads of range of partners in different sectors. So it's important we kind of collect that information on what category they're in. And finally, linking to kind of app and web interactions, we collect member engagement um, with the partner. So they can partner can see actually well, which offers are resonating best with members, which offers are getting a lot of views, but not necessarily many, many clicks or vice versa when someone is coming through and seeing the offer, it's clicked a lot. So therefore we can push that offer further and further through segmentation. And finally, sales data. So we collect this uh, via different platforms. So you can almost look at these platforms as a middleman, but between us and the advertiser. So we work with things like Awin, Rickerton, um, Partnerize and so on. So the way we collect this sort of information is we have an API connection built out um, through Clean, which we'll discuss in later detail. Um, we collect things on the transaction. So it will be how much commission we've earned from the sale, how much the member has spent on that sale, and also when the sale was essentially the three key areas of that. We also collect if a voucher code is used, so we can see which voucher codes are being redeemed most, which ones are working, which ones aren't working, and which voucher codes members are using for certain offers and certain partners. We also collect the member details, so it's important for us to track this all the way through right from kind of understanding what members are clicking on, what they're viewing, who they are, and then finally, um, the last place is what they're actually buying and which partners they're buying from. So we've got a massive view of data, loads and loads of great data coming in, but actually fundamentally to us as a business is data security. Because of the nature of our business, um, as Chris mentioned, we work with things like MOD, emergency service professionals, we need to make sure our data is secure. So this is absolutely the number one priority for us. And the way we do this is any data myself and Chris access or the entire data team is fully anonymized. So we kind of just see numbers on the screen and we won't know who that member is. So we don't get things like first name, last name, email address, addresses, anything like that for personal information. So we don't have access to that. Um, we also make sure it's got the fullest security credentials behind it in terms of where it's stored in our databases. Um, it's all fully stored in the UK as well. So it's none of it goes, kind of goes offshore. And majority of it's stored on premise as well. So it's fully locked down and secure for our members. Um, no data breached in 12 years, which is fantastic. And as I say, this is absolutely number one priority um, for our data. Worrying now that Alex is going to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> so the data picture predates when I joined back a, a year ago. Um, the, the amount of data was still consistent, that we were still collecting all of that, but it wasn't in the same formats. So there was an on-site MySQL server, which provided both data storage and site bandwidth for the website. And there were one or two people in the company that used Power BI, uh, and that was to access data and display basic reports. There was no complex analytics going on, just very basic reporting. The data in those, data, in those servers uh, was optimized for production access. Uh, meaning site queries, storage requests, and things like that could be dealt with efficiently to process the huge stream of constant information that was coming in from the website. Um, and there was a daily, what we call the snaffle download, which took, I think, in the end, about 16 hours, um, which was all of those API connectors before we built them. So that was all the information from our partners and who'd bought and what and when. Um, but that meant that it wasn't practical for analysis. Data retrieval often consisted of complex joins across multiple different tables, poorly labeled columns. My go-to example is the member IDs, which in some tables could be UID, others it could be MID, sometimes it's just ID, uh, and it's not consistent across those different tables. And some of the data retrieval requests, a bit like that daily snaffle, could take a long time, up to six hours, I think one of the ones I wrote, due to being deprioritized next to production access and they would often error, fail, or just time out. Um, so it wasn't possible to run live analysis using those on-site servers, and, and we couldn't build complex models, and we couldn't do training methods using those formats. Exactly. Oh, sorry, Matt, on. Yeah, so I was just going to say, it's a super interesting place that I think a lot of businesses find themselves in, uh, certainly businesses and uh, so some of the names that Em mentioned at the top there, I remember when I first joined Just Eat, um, way back when, it was going back quite a way, but this is exactly the situation there as well. It's hugely successful e-commerce business, um, processing 
thousands and thousands of transactions a day, but the analysis, um, the expectation was that we would be using the same production systems for that with all the challenges that you just highlighted there, Chris. And at the really real core of that is just the difference in the way that you construct the data and optimize the data for those different purposes, operational data versus analytical data. Um, and, and yeah, so th this is a really, really uh, common place to end up. So I think if you are uh, out there listening to this and thinking that, sounds familiar then, uh, then <laughs> yeah believe me it is it is really familiar so, uh, so yes yeah absolutely and similar for me Matt as well and just being that it's, it's not uncommon at all I think you're absolutely right that we're quite lucky at Blue Light Card that our data is well structured in the background in kind of my sequel in the first place so if you find yourself being you know, people on the call in this sort of situation um, as it is now on the screen if you're halfway there with the great data in the background you know you you're almost there with getting the kind of tools in and the analytical side of things um, it's not that much of a step I promise so um, why bring us in? Why bring these two handsome chaps into Blue Light Card? I know what you're thinking. Um, so firstly was kind of, we had lots of great data, but as Chris said, multiple places, silos, not optimized for kind of analytical use. So we came, came in and why they kind of brought us into the business was to really drive that one source of truth with the data. And then once they brought in quickly, stored efficiently and easily accessible, obviously for kind of analytical purposes, um, to make sure we're tracking things like KPIs and to make sure we're getting the great insights from the data itself. The second thing is the speed of getting data into people's hands. So prior to us coming in, um, as Chris said, it took hours, if not days, for people to get access it often time out. It wouldn't be the right data coming through. You'd have to rerun it again. And it's just really slow to get any data out. And when the data did come out, it was all, again, um, sort of structured in one certain way and not joined together in any sort of format. So we wanted to come in is really put data and insight into teams' hands quickly, but more importantly, promote that kind of self-serve insight element so people can go to a dashboard and get the answers they need for KPIs, or they can run their own kind of data and not have to worry about asking the analytics team, is this correct, or am I looking at the right data? Um, so that's back to my first point about one source of truth, so that confidence in using the insight and using the data themselves as well. The third side is, actually look at BLC as a business, there's little knowledge of insight and, and how to use it as a team. Um, a very, very successful business, growing and growing and growing. But actually until myself and Chris came in, there was no, in, uh, sorry, no insight and really no real understanding of how to use it. So where we sort of came in was to partner teams with use of insight. And I, I use that term partner. I don't like it's kind of being this almost reporting team. I want us to be business partners. Um, and we absolutely are with different teams around the business. So it's almost come on that journey with them, educate the teams on how to use insight how to understand those key opportunities for growth and actually use the data we've got to hand. Go on, Matt. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I, I, again, it's that, that you described it beautifully there. It's, it's going on that on that partnering journey with them and, and really, yeah, you'll hear terms like data democratisation. Uh, it's, it's banded around quite a lot and, and that means different things for different people, but I think at the heart of it, it is, it's about empowering the teams to own their own data, own their own analysis and, and uh, empower them to get to the insight they want to be delivering to, to do their day-to-day -day job uh, fundamentally. So, so yeah, I love the way you structured that and just uh, the, the, the way you're thinking about driving that um, kind of data-driven mentality into the business. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's great to see. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't want you know teams to come to us and say, how many sales did I do yesterday? That should be in a dashboard somewhere. I want teams to come to us and say, help me work on the strategies to target these numbers or help me unlock this growth future down the line with us. And that's what we can actually say that partnership and democratization side of things of really in it together and using data as a combination um, across marketing and partnerships and the analytic team. Um, that's where it's at. Cool. Uh, and finally, um, as I said, we've really grown business over the last sort of 10 years in particular um, over the last year, year or two. Um, but actually, if you look at some of the questions, it's a lot of I reckon, or I think this could work without any kind of data backing up. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's worked very well over the last years as we've grown. That's where me and Chris come in, you see this term manned around a lot, is to drive that kind of data-led culture. But generally, BLC want to use data, want to be informed by insight and drive their decisions for insight. We're already seeing the impact of that so far, even though it's only been you know, a year since Chris joined, we've only six months since he's typing in. We're on a really good journey to be able to get to that kind of data-led culture. Absolutely. So how has our data journey looked? Well, we've obviously described where we were when I started and where we wanted to get to. So before I joined, 
the heads of the company knew they wanted to make use of this huge pool of data they had, and they knew they wanted to become more data-led, so they were leveraging that data to improve business practices and uh, get better engagement from members and things. They knew that they wanted to build some sort of recommendation engine to increase engagement, usability, uh, get better return for partners, and increase um, the sort of happiness for our, our members, basically. And they knew they had enough data to do this, they just didn't know how to get about starting on that. So they decided to hire in someone who could build out complex algorithms and begin working on version one of that engine. So enter me as the data scientist. Um, before that, they had little to no experience of complex analysis or predictive analysis. And they, like I said before, they relied on basic reports, financial reports, very simple dashboards. So after I joined, I quickly identified that we needed better data infrastructure in order to provide the level of complexity they required. And what they had worked brilliantly for production access, like we've said, not so much for analysis and complex queries. So I began exploring various ELT, ETL solutions, uh, looking at outsourcing of combined data lake and data warehouse to cloud storage and computing, which is slightly better for analysis because we can scale it if we need to do big complex things at any certain point. Um, and I wanted to bring together not just the on-site MySQL database, but all the other sources of information we had as well, um, and put it all in one place. So that then led to Alex joining in December. Absolutely. So um, between kind of notice period and me joining Blue Light Card, I was in constant communication with Chris, just because I was really excited to join, obviously, but <laughs> also for him to kind of bounce ideas and just go through kind of the options on the table um, and what kind of data warehouse solutions and ETL solutions were, were in the pipeline. Um, and this gave us a really good place when I come in to understand exactly what we're going for, why we're going for it. And I'm happy to say January 2021, clean came into our lives a very 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 happy day um but thanks to chris's great work um a few months before that we're able to understand what clean offers straight away and go straight into build and deployment with clean so why do we pick clean um what was it about clean that really suited our needs um so firstly we love the fact that clean is one tool um suit all our needs for elt all the way into data warehouse so as Chris mentioned, when we we're looking through different options, we could have had maybe four different tools or so. One to kind of bring in the different data sources, one as a kind of SQL console, one maybe delivering as a data warehouse, and maybe one as a scheduler or something like that. What we realized about Clean is you can do that all in one platform. Um, so you can schedule things overnight for us to run. Obviously got all the great connectors in as well. It's got SQL console, so myself and Chris can run things. And it's just that kind of all encompassing ELT to all strength our data warehouse so we can get up and running really really quickly. The second thing was as myself and Chris were the first kind of couple of data hires in it really kind of eliminates that need to hire a team of data engineers so I know a lot of teams will, will look to kind of data engineers to hire in straight away to kind of build those pipelines out or get data sources connected up through clean this really eliminated that that need um, and as a growing team and us kind of justifying our um, values of the business we did want to throw loads of loads of money at it um, straight away. We want to build scalably, but smartly as well. So this way clean really came into it and we don't obviously need those um, data engineers to come in to run the platform. The third, the third side was both myself and Chris have got SQL backgrounds. Um, so we know SQL very, very well. And actually through clean, it's obviously SQL constructs. So it's very intuitive for us to use, really quick for us to get to grips with uh, and start pulling data in absolutely rapidly and get scripts to the platform very, very easily. And finally, just as a company, Clean really aligned with our values. So you'll hear a lot of Blue Light Card um, talk about the DLC family. Um, I'm sure Clean is exactly the same. They're just really genuinely lovely people, but also they align with kind of our ambition. They got us as a business and got where we wanted to go with data analytics and just have provided us with a platform that all suits all our needs, but also they kind of understood what our needs are and helped us along the way as well. So fantastic to hear all of that. Really, uh, the the you can pay me later, Matt. Don't worry. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's difficult hearing uh, a bit big in the room. Well, well, being hit with praise, but no, it's, it's it's lovely to hear that the uh, the tool and the approach uh, fits so well with you guys. And and from our point of view, it was it was uh, equally a, uh, an absolute pleasure to be able to um, 
start work with people who just so obviously get the space and understand exactly what the what the outcomes are that, that you're driving towards um that's a beautiful place to be i think uh, we'll, we'll uh, we often work with uh, with companies who um uh, want to go on that journey that, that you've already been on as well and actually um there's there's a real advantage in in sort of partnering up on the, the tool selection as you go through that journey um, to, to, towards the understanding of what the outcomes are going to be. So um, it's, 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 never, it's never too soon, I think is, is probably the, the sort of uh, take home message of that. But, but yeah, I, uh, if, if this blue light card thing doesn't work out, then uh, and you guys <laughs> want to <laughs> work on our sales team, I can't think of a better, uh, <laughs> a better side than the one that's on screen right now. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks, mate. <clears throat> Um, so just touching kind of more on the foundations, obviously Clean um, really helped us out in, in January, but actually we really started to build the warehouse out and build the kind of data structure and the foundations behind everything we unlock from Insight um, through great data and great structured data. And um, this really happened between January and March. So myself and Chris writing tons and tons of SQL codes, bringing in different connectors and just making sure that the warehouse is kind of built by analysts or data analysts and um, for analysts essentially. So. Clean's obviously really helped um, with that side of things, that SQL console and their kind of transform steps within there. For the first few months, really just spent building out that data warehouse. But at the same time, we also wanted to get people using reports and uh, using the kind of data we're producing. So we also implemented Tableau around the same time. Um, took about a month or so to implement and get the first few dashboards running. But it just gave people access to either numbers they'd never seen before or within you know a few seconds rather than a few hours um, to get data in their hands so everyone's really pleased with how the foundations were going but we need to scale the team so this is kind of where we wanted to have a chat between myself and Chris and the board on how do we scale the team appropriately for the insight we're going to produce and our kind of roadmap ahead so March April time um, we landed on two key areas where we wanted to grow the team first um, which were member insights and partner insights. Um, we hired two fantastic analysts in, in Echo and, and Callum, both on the call today, but they are generally fantastic analysts as well um, and helped us grow massively as a, as a team. The reason we kind of wanted to go through these two areas, if you look back to kind of the, the data we bring in, these are the two areas we have the most data on uh, and the two key areas for, for growth for us. So member insight and Callum. So Callum really kind of unlocks insight into member behavior and trends. So really kind of understanding what members are interacting with when they're interacting, segmentations um, going forwards, and that sort of stuff. Echo, on the other hand, is our partnership insight analyst, and it's insight into part of behavior and trends. So understanding what offers are working, what companies are working, how can we do case studies to new companies that are wanting to onboard a blue light card and just showcase the value of blue light cards to them and all that great stuff. So this is how we wanted to scale the team in the first place with a couple of analyst hires. But actually, as of just a couple of months ago, um, we brought in the product team um, into the data team, which a lot of you on the call might think that's a bit of a strange move. Um, I, did the, I did as well when we first talked about it, but actually thinking about it, it makes complete sense. So we have two UX UI designers um, in the data insight team now. And what they do is make sure we have an exceptional customer journey on our app, on our website. So we're picking up key customer pain points on the way. We're making sure the journey is seamless if you're signing up to Blue Light Card or if you're renewing your Blue Light Card or whatever it is. And actually, all of that is led by data. So it's led by interaction points on the site, interaction points on the app. Um, and if we're testing a new journey out, we'll maybe test it with 10% of people, for example. And again, all the data that comes through will inform us, is it successful? Is it not successful? Should we keep doing it? So it makes complete sense having them in the team as well. And it's been a really nice addition to have that kind of creative flair um, in the team as well. Go for that. Yeah, that, it's it, it's it's very reminiscent actually of um, of the journey we went on, Justy, and I've mentioned it before, but uh, in exactly the same way, that kind of A/B testing methodology mm -hmm. that you just described, that uh, constant build, measure, learn, uh, iterate uh, approach, just it, it's it is pure data. It is pure data. Yeah. There is, of course, the kind of the creative and the art to it to have the ideas of what you want to yes. what, what you want to design, but um, by being able to collect and analyze the data very very quickly you really sort of 
engender that creative uh, that creative spirit and allow those ideas to uh, to be tested and you know the bad ones discarded the good ones um propagated so yeah it's a it's a, it's a great way of thinking of it and uh, great to see that the infrastructure that you've built has really empowered this part of it feeding back into your product directly yeah. um that's uh, yeah it's awesome to see absolutely and don't get me wrong we're very very early days with this um, so as you mentioned that A-B testing, multivariate testing is exactly where I want to go and making sure testing as much as we can on site and on the app. Um, where we're going to scale the team kind of further is in that kind of web analytics or marketing analytics. It's in conversion rate optimization and those side of things. Um, we'll also bring away, if you look forward uh, a few months or so, we are hiring out um, the research arm of the team as well. So combine really the whys and what's, uh, which makes complete sense. And then we're also hiring kind of a data analyst as well. So team is growing very quickly but for me in absolutely the right way um, to scale this team going forwards that's testament to the work that's awesome yes, so we've mentioned before that the data team um uh the company before the data team sorry the company relied on descriptive statistics and dashboards they worked with post event reporting which i by which i mean uh, there was a time delay on information being used or even coming in. So when an event happened, they had to wait, first of all, for the event. Then they had to wait for the data from the event to trickle into the system in a usable format. And then they had to automatic, sorry, manually update the dashboards. So it wasn't the best use of the data that was there. With the implementation of our single source of truth lake and warehouse, the hiring of our first team members and etc. Uh, we're now moving to a much more predictive analytical system. So we have the data, we have the trends, and we're able to say what might happen and future proof our offers and our member base against those eventualities. We're also moving towards the data led goal, being able to define actions. You know, what can we do as a company? What systems can we try and put in place? And what impact will they have before we implement them? So what do we think is going to be the most effective? What do we think is going to be the most engaging uh, based on the data? I think this is this is the place that you get to when you free up uh, super smart, uh, you know, highly skilled people like uh, like you guys and Echo and Callum are on the call as well, uh, free you up from the, the plumbing the you know getting data from one place to another getting it actually into that single uh, central location um it it moves you along this the exact journey that you've got here on screen um and it's it's uh, uh you, you know you need both you need the super skilled people but if you have the super skilled people without um that those blockers moved out of the way you end up having those super skilled people constantly wrestling with those blockers rather than doing the, the the value add that we've got on the right hand side of the screen so uh it's great to see that you guys are really cap capitalizing on that um uh, recently and, and and building the team off the back of that it's uh yeah fantastic absolutely and i think that fits into the way we've tried to approach it as well by building those fundamentals building the basic blocks we need in order to get to that rather than trying to leap straight into the really complex stuff mm. and then hitting those roadblocks constantly and slowing us down yeah, absolutely. Exactly that. Like, like Alex said, you don't want to be uh, having questions of how many sales did we do yesterday. That should be on a dashboard. That should be answered by default. Um, and yeah, you know, but if if you don't have that on a dashboard, then you do have to answer that because you know you need to know that information, right? So uh, if you haven't got it on a dashboard, then unfortunately, uh, some highly skilled uh, data scientist is is off answering a basic rudimentary dashboarding question rather than building predictive and prescriptive analytics, as you say. So yeah, yeah, fantastic approach to get the get the foundations in place. Absolutely, absolutely. And don't get me wrong; like we're still very much at the at the start of this. Like we've come a long, long way um, in sort of a year, six months or so. Um, I've got to a great place now. We're very, very exciting journey ahead over the next couple of years or so. Um, but there have been, you know, challenges on the way. Um, and, and right, so you know, it's not been easy at all to get to where we've got to now, but it's so rewarding to do and very, very happy with where we are currently. Absolutely. So how has Clean specifically helped us to get to where we are since they joined us in January? Well, big thing, they help to set up those connectors. So the APIs that Alex mentions that show our um, how much our members have interacted with our partners, what sales we've made, etc. 
which saved us hiring a team of data engineers, which we would have needed to do that or to achieve the same that Clean has in the same amount of time. Um, they've helped us with the single source of truth. So we know that we're all working from the same slate in the company. We know that any numbers we report are consistent across the company, and we know that everybody should know where those numbers come from. So if we're using a specific KPI within one team, um, they should know how that is formulated or how it's calculated. Onboarding has also been super quick and easy. So Echo and Callum, who are in the call when they joined, they both have past SQL experience and they can look at that clean interface and sort of intuitively know how to, how to work with it, how to do it, so they can hit the ground running. And they might not know every aspect of the interface, but once they joined, they were off making their own SQL transformations and setting up things and schedules and all sorts. So it was fantastic to see and sped things up for us. And a big shout out to Emily because she's been fantastic. She was the only support person when we first joined. Now you've got a bit of a team, I know, but they're always really friendly and happy to help. They're always on hand. Uh, we can send them a message and half an hour later, we've got an answer. And it can be something super complex as well, like, oh, one of the API connectors isn't returning what we think it should be. Can you check into this? And Emily's off badgering developers and saying, oh, what's going on? And she comes back with an answer. It's fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant, great. Brilliant. I will be uh, paying you later. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone, um, for listening in to us. And are there any questions? Or yes, there are. So um, a couple came through whilst we were um, on the call. So we've got: How did you convince the business um, or show the value to the business of expanding the team? So how did that conversation go when you said, you know, we need to grow beyond just two of us? Um, and what was the initial reaction to that? I think we just started putting value on the work we're doing and showing them the roadmap ahead, what you could do with um, a bigger team. So myself and Chris, it, it came down to a resource issue more than anything. Um, over the first few months or so. So there are loads of great questions coming in on, you know, I want to start segmenting our data. I want to start doing X, Y, and Z. But yes, these are brilliant questions, but there's two of us. So it was a case of, look, set out the roadmap between myself and Chris. This way we want to get to um, in the next year or so. These are the teams we need. These are the, sorry, the um, people we need to hire in. And this is why. So that was the first kind of step to it. Over the last couple of months, when I've been kind of looking to scale the team further and further over the next year, rightly so the business has been kind of going, you know, um, what value add is that going to be above and beyond what we've got now? And it's starting to put those kind of, um, that monetary value on what we're doing. So we are sending out a segmented email or we are starting to onboard new clients via our data. Then it's saying, actually, this is the worth of that data to the business. And if we didn't have these sort of insights out, we wouldn't be able to get to this. So it's starting to put on, you know what, you want to get to this sort of growth and this sort of um, commission and, and money in terms of revenue terms then this is what we need to hire in. So I think it's those two key aspects. Anything else to add on to that whole? No, I think that's pretty good. There's also ties back to what Matt and I were talking about earlier with just elements of scale. Do you want to spend lots of money on a high-end person doing a basic job, or do you want to scale the team appropriately and have the right person to do the job? You can probably do it faster than I can because I'm not used to doing that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Do you guys also feel as though the appetite for data spreads throughout the entire business? I know you mentioned you want to really hone in on uh, marketing analytics in, in the coming months. Do you feel as though the adoption has really kind of covered every department within Blue Light Card? 100%. 100%. Um, I've been amazed at how much people want data in the business. A lot of companies say they want to be kind of data led, um, but actually you, you're grounded down doing the kind of plumbing work, as Matt said, or they almost, they know better because they've been in the business a long time or whatever it is. But genuinely, we are probably the most busy people in the business um, just because of the amount of questions we get, the amount of teams we work with. And I haven't come across anyone at all that doesn't want to use Insight for good reasons or, you know, really want to understand how to unlock something, um, whether it be member growth, whether it be partner growth, even things like management accounts, just getting their reports from you to Tableau, um, get access more quickly. Um, customer support teams getting access to what tickets are coming in and so on. There's a lot of use cases across the business, but that adoption has been very, very quick. Um, but we love the amount of questions coming in. And as I said before, it's just the education piece of people coming along that journey with us. How do I use this? It's a question of how do I use this, not 
why should I use this? It's very much to help me understand how to do this and so on. Absolutely. And it was exactly the same before Alex joined. There were people from all over the business that would come and ask me questions because they knew I was a data person. They didn't exactly understand how it worked, but they'd say, well, can we figure this out? Can we, can we work on this? Um, and there were some really interesting things that came out of that as well. Um, Alex mentioned the support team. I think that's one of our big ones recently because we've got 3 million members and a really small team. When I first joined, there were about 20 people in the company. So how do we deal with those, that volume of incoming tickets and how do we prioritize, how do we sort and organize those kind of things? Um, and if you build up those basic uh, use cases, then people really start to see the value quickly. All right, <clears throat> my takeaway from that, Chris, is 3 million customers, 20 support people. I think- Well, it wouldn't have been 20 support people. It would have been a lot less than that. <laughs> yeah, I think 20 people in the entire business, Matt. Oh, so 20 the entire, oh wow, okay, well, I mean, this, this is a no-brainer then, Em. We've, we've got our ratios for customer success to, to clients, right? Uh, off the back of that. Absolutely not, I'm starting. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. No, I mean, that, that's that's incredible. That's uh, incredible ratio. So, uh, yeah, it's, I, think it's, I think it's just, it's about building that credibility, isn't it? It's about yeah. being proved by doing, show your credibility, your reliability, uh, build the trust with the business, and then, mm -hmm. Um, and, and show the possibility of, of, of what's possible and, and you know, exactly what you've just, just described really should follow. You should have people uh, knocking down your door for, uh, for you know, more data, uh, more uh, areas of the business to throw data at. So, yeah, Absolutely. really executes that well. Absolutely. I think it's, it's exciting with data as well. Um, so as you say, Matt, getting people bought in, it's all about that kind of excitement element as well. So if you just throw some tables at them and some charts and some numbers, they'll switch off very, very quickly. Um, I think between myself, Callum, Echo and Chris, what we've really tried to do is, you know, do kind of beautiful slides, really get them on board with what's going on and say what they can do with this sort of data rather than just showing them a, a table on the screen, essentially. So it's that excitement factor about what insight is. I think it's really helped us. We've just had a another question come in as well, um, which I think is a brilliant one. So um, you mentioned that your data team emerged at a late stage of the business. Do you think it's worth spending time and money on building a data team in the early days? That's a really good question. Um, I would I say, on, I think, go on, Chris, go for, so it. go for it. It depends on what you want to get from the company. So BLC thrived without a data team. They, they managed to build a substantial uh, customer base, member base, partnerships, etc. cetera. Um, but there are other companies which would absolutely flounder without a data team. They need that information constantly. And the difference that BLC has found is that actually implementing all this stuff post hoc is more work. So if you build it as you go along, you have less of a hard time of it, if that makes sense. Um, the, the production system they had was perfect. It was great. It did everything they needed it to, but it wasn't suitable for analysis. And sometimes when you don't have a data person in, that's the situation you end up in. And like Matt and Alex have said, that's a really common situation um, because you're not thinking about the data in terms of analytics. You're thinking out about it in terms of efficiency and how things get stored and recorded. And that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd agree, Chris. I think um, also kind of understanding what data team you want in place. So what roles do you need in a team? Um, a lot of big companies will start investing in kind of data teams, um, you know, way down the line and so on, which is absolutely fine. But take a look at kind of legacy data you might have in the company. Does it need unscrambling in the first place? Does it need a kind of data engineer or data analyst coming in as a first hire? Or does it need um, kind of an, an, an insight analyst coming in? So first take a look at that. And then just almost go through the process myself and Chris in the last few months is, what hires do we need to make? What's going to have the most impact for the business? What are the questions coming in from the business? And hiring, hiring that manner rather than just going, I need a data team, let's get a data person in. Think about specifically what areas of insight or data you want to hire in for my advice would be. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I love, love that question. Uh, I think it, it, exactly as Chris says, it does depend. Um, and, and, and yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more with you, Alex, that being so sort of targeted about it and getting some wins on the board uh, early and quickly um, to go back to the previous question of building that trust and, and, uh, and sort of buy-in. Um, but, but yeah, I think um, yeah, I've joined companies 
relatively late stage as the first data person into, into a business before. And as you said, Chris, it's, it's really hard work to then go and start tidying things up because decisions are made in systems and uh, you know processes and so on that just don't lend themselves well. Uh, and you have to do a lot of work to overcome those, the, the hurdles that emerge from that. Um, and I think you can go a long way without data. Um, if you're not in a particularly competitive space or, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe you're, you're sort of isolated from, um, uh, from competition, but that only lasts so long. And I feel like a stuck record, keep mentioning Just Eat, but you know, I joined as the, the first data person, a dedicated data person there into their product team. Um, and a lot of the response I got was, well, look, everything's up and to the right. Why do we need to, why do we need to measure it? Uh, at the time, they're right, there's just, very little competition. Um, and then uh, you know, a couple of years later, <clears throat> Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Amazon, all of these incredibly competitive tech-led organizations just sprung onto the market. And uh, Just Eat would have been completely swallowed up uh, if they couldn't uh, actually have a competitive edge as a result of the data initiatives that, that happened there and the data science programs that they could put in place to uh, to maintain that that market position so um, i think the earlier you do it the better and uh, from a from an ease point of view um, but yeah being really targeted in that approach is, is super important to prove that value love that question yeah brilliant question i'm just going to share the results of the poll as well so everyone can see and have a bit of an understanding of, sort of kind of our audience uh, today we can see that 50 percent of the audience are are in the early days of their data journey um so hopefully you're finding this um really useful um we've also had another question come in um which i think is also a really good one um as a direct consumer business, we focus a lot on brand and I feel we should be using our data to better the brand and product. How have you found incorporating product into your data team? So it's, it's, it's very early days um, at the moment, um, but what we've wanted to come across is kind of that customer and member experience. So if you look at our kind of app and website from, uh, if you put yourself in the member shoes, are you excited? Do you see it as a seamless journey? Do you see, um, do you get excited when you go into the website and, and the app? So this way, kind of the UX UI designers have really come in to help us. But what they want to do is make sure they're testing things with data. So when I say that, we've just implemented a new sign-up journey, for example, and just making sure it's more seamless for members. And by doing that, we didn't go, right, we're just going to switch off the older one to have a new one. We might, we put through, say, 10, 20% of our members through this new journey, see how it impacted certain metrics, it's okay, it's working. Let's up it to about 50%. Okay, still working. And then kind of turn it all to 100%. So I think that thinking before wasn't really in. It was a case of actually, let's just flip it and, and see what happens. Um, go all 100% straight away. So that helped. That's really, really helped us. I think with the branding side of things, it's, it's still to come almost with the research element. So where we want to really get members feedback on is things on logos, on campaigns, on X, Y, and Z to do with our, our branding in particular, on what do they think of it? What would they change? What would they update? Um, and so on. So that's where that really comes, comes into it. The other thing we'll start doing as well is start split testing email content. So if we push things to the top with big logos and our big branding on it, does that get better open rates? Does that get better um, click-throughs, conversions, and so on? Or actually, does, does it not make any impact whatsoever? So as these start to start things where we're starting to test out, um, and that's what's really helped us kind of with that product team coming in, having that creative flair mixed with kind of the insight is really helping us to have firm decisions on what we're doing, but also we, we have the kind of creativeness, uh, creativity, sorry, that was kind of, I guess, not traditional in data teams, um, but we can look at, okay, I change this logo to this, this and this, um, and we'll kind of test out with data, data head on. That's the question. Um, we have had uh, another question. Great questions, guys. So please do keep them coming. Um, how do you balance the early hires between the production, so getting analytics and insights out, and scale? creating mature processes with growing data and needs. And also just if we could dive into kind of full stack versus specialization. So I, obviously I was the first data hire in the company. And I think one of the things that attracted them to me was 
being a bit of a jack of all trades. So you mentioned full stack versus specialization. And actually I had my finger in a lot of different pots. I was on the product team. I was working across different things. I wasn't just an analytics person. I could build out the Lambda APIs if we needed them. I could build out the, the complex connectors and that kind of thing. And I think for your early hires, that's what you want. You either want to go with someone who's a bit junior, who's going to focus just on writing SQL because you've got a system that they can use, or you want someone who's a bit more, a bit more generalist and can work with lots of different things and build those processes as they go. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Alex? <laughs> no, I, I can pretty agree with you. Like in the in the early early stages, you want someone to kind of do a bit of everything. Um, which myself and Chris have both the experience of. So, you know, yes, we can write SQL and everything, but also we've got um, a bit of kind of database, data warehousing experience. Chris obviously got the experience with um, kind of modeling and kind of being a product team and, and different side of things on that. I've got a bit of experience with research, uh, data analytics as a whole and so on. So I think straight away, you kind of want to hire someone that can do a little bit of everything and understand um, where they can add value straight away. Um, but yeah, I think scaling, scaling from there, um, it, it's just a case of, again, looking at what, what you need up front and then hiring in those kind of skill sets. So if, say, I, I always say for my, for my team, I want, to, I want to bring in people that will teach me something. So I want to hire in a skill set I don't have necessarily. So bringing kind of Cal and Echo in, um, they'll have certain skills that I don't have um, or I've got experience that I don't have as well. Um, similar with kind of Joe and Saj in the, in the product team coming in. Again, UX UI designers, completely not my skill set at all, but can teach me. Um, that sort of thing. So you start to build that kind of jack of all trades and you know, that knowledge base across the team you're working with as well. Absolutely. I think Alex and I balance each other out really well. Um, and that was one of the aspects that helped us build this team quite well. Agreed. There was another question, Emily, I don't know if you saw. I answered. Yeah, I was just about to dive into that because I think you made such a brilliant point there. So if you could just talk to that um, kind of live, Chris, that would be that would be brilliant. Absolutely. The, the question was, what was the impact of providing dashboards to other departments in the business and did they see the value? I'm going to let Alex take that one. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Absolutely. So um, I think previously for, um, you know, World of Data Warehouse and, and Tableau, is honestly hours, if not days, or just not having that data access at all. So people just switched off, didn't use the numbers, um, didn't look at them because they were just annoyed by how long it took to use them. So I think the impacts we've seen is generally people not struggle to do their job at all is in terms of you know working with partners or working with um, teams, but they want that data up front to understand how they've done on a daily basis to understand what, what, the, what was the impact of that? What partner was up yesterday? How do we impact this email and so on? So it's really aiding in their jobs. Never report's not running now. We know about it straight away. Like we know that it's down because somebody will be shouting saying, where is this, where is this, and, and so on. So that is testament to how much they're being, being used. Um, they are used every single day. Um, if I look at like my Tableau accounts on users, um, everyone's logging in pretty much on a daily basis. We've got about 8% active users on there. And I think it's just that speed element more than anything. I think it's just having numbers to hand. Um, the one key thing we've done as well is through kind of Tableau, um, you can email out to inboxes, um, certain stats or certain reports and so on. So we've sent the board certain reports, we've sent the marketing team certain reports and the partnerships team certain reports, and they have them in their inbox every single morning and they can just look at their key stats really, really quickly, easily and so on. Um, and the second part of that is putting numbers in their hands they've just honestly never had access to before because of the way the data was structured previously, to combine things like a member with what they're clicking on, with what they're viewing on, with what partner they're buying from, sounds simple, but it just wasn't structured in that way historically. So now we've kind of got what we have, um, master tables in our data warehouse. So we can see everything connects together. It's very, very quick to run. It's very efficiently stored. So they can connect the dots very, very quickly across different, um, different metrics, different users and so on. So. I think previously dashboards weren't used at all, even though we had them just for the speed. But right now, um, because the speed's there, the insights there, and different metrics, they're used on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd focus on those two key elements, join the dots and speed of access. I think the uh, <clears throat> thing to add to that, which you guys are probably a bit too modest to say, is you, you have obviously done a fantastic job of um, aligning the metrics and the design of dashboards to the audience, which is such a critical bit of this, that 
you know, there's there's dashboards and there's dashboards in the sense that you've the, the dashboard has got to contain the metrics and the KPIs and the visualizations of those metrics and KPIs in a way that really impacts with the audience they're intended for, so that they're genuinely useful and they're genuinely uh, sort of adopted in that way. Um, so there's a there's a it's a there's an art to good data visualization and good data presentation, um, and the the adoption that you are seeing of that of those tableau dashboards is uh, obviously testament to the the work you've done in that space. Uh, I think the trick is about aligning your dashboard to the KPIs that are important for the business. And so many businesses don't know what KPIs they should be looking at and how those KPIs uh, interact with one another, influence one another, and, the, and a sort of hierarchical approach to those KPIs. What's the what's the North Star metric for the for the business? And then what are the you know increasingly operational things and KPIs and metrics that you need visibility of and then who owns each of those KPIs and how do we surface them to the uh, those owners in the uh, in the dashboard design within Tableau or Power BI or Looker or whatever your BI tool is of choice. Um, so it's it's clear that you've done a really good job of that to get the kind of resonance that you're, uh, that you're subsequently seeing. Of course, alongside the speed of delivery and the speed of uh, you know, load and, and, and everything else that, that, that you've talked to. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a, it can be a tricky thing to get right, um, but when you do, it's, um, it, it's night and day uh, in terms of the impact on the business. Absolutely. There's a bit of a tangential impact as well, which isn't necessarily direct to the, the consumers in the company, but say for myself, so just this week, for example, I actually said to Alex, um, I was working on a specific model and one of the tables he'd created had all the information I needed already. And I'd said to him, well, I plan to use the entire day to try and pull this information and get it in formats I needed. And I didn't need that in the end. So it took me a day to build the model where it would have been maybe a week before. So it's that kind of access to data and having things in usable formats. Yeah. Phenomenal. Um, okay, guys. Well, I think that's. Uh, I think. Oh, we've literally just got uh, another question. Um, what about member get member? How did data allow you to identify and automate message to super tribe members, aka brand warriors, to <laughs> empower them to get new tribe members? Um, and then there's a the second part to the question. But would would you be able to touch on that first? I absolutely love that wording. I've never yeah. heard of. <laughs> Yeah. Super tribe members before, but that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so, Congress. Go on, Alex. No, it's all right. Um, so I think this is where we're starting to get to. Um, this is this is the next step, essentially. This is the next year or so. So something as a team where we're really focusing on is that kind of segmentation. So Callum, for example, has just built out a great life cycle segmentation um, through like ours. So previously we had a certain definition as our active members. Um, really, really broad, put them into one massive pot, basically. So if, for example, I'd have clicked an offer in the last week, and if I'd have clicked an offer in the last six months, uh, I'd be passed into the same pot. So although it kind of worked from a business sense, it just was way too broad to target people correctly. So the work Callum's been doing is to really identify those pots. Um, I love the word brand warriors. We have kind of champions as ours. So um, people that are constantly on the app, frequently purchasing, and so on. So we might message them with certain messages versus people that might not use the app for a few months or so um, and have kind of dropped off a little bit. Again, message them with a certain set of communications. Um, this is literally in progress as we speak, um, as in this, this week. So this is where we're going to over the next few months or so. Uh, and something Callum and Chris have both been working on is things like segmentation. So if you look ahead to the next few months or so, uh, when I say segmentation, we're starting to send out communications that are relevant to the member. So I always, in previous role, I was always targeted on like um, an irrelevant rate. So a lot of the industry talk about a 20% open rate being good or a 30% open rate being good. To me, that's 10% irrelevance for that, those members. So actually, we should focus on that number, not the other one. So where we're going to target our communications is making sure people are opening emails or a push notification, for example, that's going out is targeted to a certain cohort of members based on either what they've been buying before, uh, what they like as companies, what they've been viewing, whatever it is, or things like seasonality as well. I know it sounds crazy, but things like, you know, the euros, for example, could we push offers out for like 
KFC or any beer brands we've got on that is relevant and really reactive marketing, for example. So it's those sort of things we're starting to get to over the next few months. And that's where the true insight is and the real excitement factor for business. Yeah, and there's also the element of if you've got those super tribe members or your brand warriors, they're generally okay. You don't need to do too much nudging with them. You can focus more on the ones who are more likely to drop off or are a bit unsure, so they're sort of on the fence. Um, and part of that work that Alex mentioned we're doing is looking at uh, renewal likeliness for the subscriptions. So if they're really likely to renew, we'll leave them, they're fine. If they're likely to maybe drop off, how can we nudge them back up? How can we make them re-engage? Um, and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I mean, ultimately talking customer segmentation, the more data driven you can get that, uh, the, the, uh, and the closer to segments of one, you know, you are a, a unique uh, user or, or uh, you know, member or uh, whatever the uh, terminology is in your business, the closer you can get to that um, from the data. And, and when I say that, I mean, what are the attributes that define um, that, that individual? Um, behavioural attributes, demographic attributes, etc. Uh, and the smaller you can get those segments, then the more meaningfully uh, you can speak to them and therefore the more likely you are to influence them up that value chain. And exactly as you said, Chris, the, the uh, super drive members, the brand warriors are the, the, the where you want everybody to be. So what is it that marks them out as those high value uh, customers and, and how do you influence the behavior of your lower value customers into that uh, up the value chain into that segment and that is pure data the more data you can gather on them uh, into that single customer view you're often here talked about um the, the the richer that single customer view the more informed your crm campaigns your product your uh, brand targeting and so on uh, can get with the audience that you're talking to it's uh, it's all data yeah definitely Thank you so much, guys. That, that has been really useful. And hopefully uh, everyone who's joined us today has some uh, actionable insights to take away. Um, if you do have any kind of follow-up questions for us, um, I'm just going to drop an email address in the chat here. Hello at clean.ai. Please do um, keep your questions coming in afterwards. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for joining. And thank you, Chris, Alex, and Matt for um, a brilliant presentation. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.